This evening, uh, we're returning to the Gospel of John, um, but several chapters ahead, so that by the time we get to it again, we'll probably have forgotten <laughs> what it is we looked at here. But let me read a portion, um, John 18, in verses 28 through 37, and really the idea that we're looking at is contained in verses 36 and 37. The fact that Jesus is a king, but that his kingdom is not of this world. So what we want to do is understand what his kingdom is like and understanding it, what it is that we are called to do in it. John 18, beginning in verse 28, we read this. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the Praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now remember this morning we saw that after Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, he sent the disciples away to Capernaum, and he also sent the people away back to their homes while he went up on the mountain so that the people and the disciples would not be tempted to make him king. Remember we saw this morning in John chapter 6, so they wouldn't force him to be king. Now Jesus, as we know very well, as we've just read here, is a king. That's why he came into the world. Remember Isaiah writes a passage that we read every Christmas season. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Is Jesus a king? Of course, uh, he was born to be king. And I want you to notice a couple of things that this passage reminds us of. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And again, we've read about this in Psalm 72. But he didn't come, you see, to be the kind of king that the Jews were expecting an earthly political king that had come to help the Jews overthrow Rome. His kingdom was not of this world. Though, of course, in those days, as well as today, it would have influence over the kingdoms of the world, an influence that would gradually increase. There will be no end to the increase of his government. So what I'd like to do this evening is simply consider two things. The nature of Jesus' kingdom and understanding the nature of that kingdom, then our role uh, in it. So first of all, let's consider uh, the nature of Jesus' kingdom. And the first thing I want to point out, of course, is the fact that Jesus' kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. As we've seen, when Jesus was on trial before Pilate, he said in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Now, Jesus is telling us that his kingdom is not what we usually think of as a kingdom. It doesn't have geographical boundaries. You, know, you can't go to a specific place in the world and look at it, it's marvelous buildings and so forth. It doesn't have political power. It isn't a government that is set up somewhere in the world that is legislating what we can and can't do, at least like the legislatures or the governments of this earth. And it doesn't have an army at its disposal, at least like the armies of the nations, like the army, for instance, of this particular nation. Jesus said that if his kingdom had been of that kind, of that nature, his servants or his army would be fighting for him to save his life so that he wouldn't be handed over to the Jews for execution. Now, you'll notice, I mentioned this morning, the, the disciples had this expectation as well, and they still had it all the way at the end of Jesus' ministry just before he ascended. And I think that's the reason why Peter, on one occasion, made the mistake of taking up a sword to defend Jesus and cutting off the, the ear of the uh, high servant's or excuse me, of the high priest's servant. Jesus told Peter to put his sword up, put it away. He healed the servant and he cautioned his disciples against advancing the kingdom by force of arms. By the way, that's a lesson the church apparently didn't learn as the Crusades during the Middle Ages remind us. Now, if it isn't that kind of kingdom, what kind of a kingdom is it? Well, Jesus tells us that it is a spiritual kingdom and one that influences all the kingdoms of the world. It's not like those kingdoms, but it certainly does influence them. Now, just because it isn't like the other kingdoms doesn't mean it can't or doesn't exert influence in the world. The kingdom of heaven can, and as a matter of fact, it does to varying degrees according to God's will. The king over this kingdom has an absolute right to dictate Morality, what it is we will or will not do. As a matter of fact, the opening words of Jesus' ministry declares that in Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is what the king of the kingdom demands, repentance and belief. And now that he has gone into heaven to sit at God's right hand, to take up his mediatorial reign, endued with power, all power and authority in heaven and earth, he commands his church to preach this message of faith and repentance to all the nations uh, with the promise that the Father has given to him that every knee will eventually bow to him. Now, I thought to understand the nature of this kingdom a little better and also what our role is in this kingdom that we would look at that... Um, series of parables that our Lord Jesus actually gave in Matthew 13 to describe to his disciples, although at the same time to hide it from the Jews, just exactly what this kingdom is like. So in these parables, in what we call again the kingdom parables, he tells us, first of all, how the message of this kingdom would be communicated and how it was going to be received in the parable of the sower. And that we find in Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9, a very familiar passage. Jesus says, Behold, the sower went out to sow. By the way, I want to read these because we're going to see that these are explaining to us not only the nature of the kingdom, but what our role is in it. And we'll get to our role towards the end. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate them up. Others fell in the rocky places where they did not have much soil. Immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus is saying the gospel would be communicated not just by him, although he did, but by his servants. 
And as they did, the results would differ according to the condition of the hearers. And of course, that's, well, um, well, ultimately in God's hands. He tells us secondly that as his church would be about her work of spreading the gospel, the enemy would also be sowing his crop in the world, his children, in an attempt to thwart what it is that God was doing in the parable of the wheat and the tares in verses 24 through 30. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. So basically he was saying that there would be both true sons of the kingdom and false sons in the church and in the world until the end when they would all be sorted out. Basically... Um, he tells us not only there, but he also tells us in the parable of the dragnet in verses 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish in the containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The wheat and the tares being together till the end of the age gathered, the, the uh, tares bound up in bundles and burned, the wheat gathered into the barn, and so here the bad are thrown away, the good are gathered and put into containers. Now Jesus goes on to tell us that the kingdom of heaven would begin very small, but eventually would grow in its influence until it encompassed the entire earth, as we see in the parable of the mustard seed. Verses 31 through 32. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. By the way, I don't know if, if the, uh, yeah, see in, in the text, you'll notice the, um, the all caps. That's where the Old Testament is being quoted. And basically, in this illusion that Jesus is making to the Old Testament, he's drawing this picture, this image, from that which God used to picture Nebuchadnezzar's world-embracing kingdom in the dream that he gave him just before, of course, he humbled him and, and made him as a beast for a while because he wanted him to realize it was God who did this. But this is what we see in Daniel chapter 4, verses 20 through 22, as Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is being described, or basically Nebuchadnezzar himself as he represents the kingdom is being described as this great tree. Daniel writes, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. This idea of the birds nesting in the branches and the beasts or the animals dwelling under the foliage of uh, this great tree represents, uh, of course, the fruitfulness of the tree as well, represents the provision and the protection that Babylon provided because of its greatness. Well, Jesus takes that same image and he applies it to the kingdom of heaven. It begins small, but it becomes a great tree so that the birds of the heavens nest in its branches. Basically, he's saying 
that Christ's kingdom is going to grow until it encompasses, as we read in Psalm 72, all the nations of the earth. We read also in Scripture that all the nations are going to flock, as it were, to the mountain of the Lord to learn the law of God from His mouth. Jesus tells us that the influence of the kingdom is eventually going to permeate the entire earth in the parable of the leaven. In verse 33, He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So the kingdom of heaven is the leaven, and the flour is the world. And eventually this leaven, which, as you know, is, an, is a permeating influence, is going to work its way through the entire lump, as it were, the three pecks of flour, until all of it is leavened. Basically, the kingdom of heaven is going to saturate the world. Nebuchadnezzar had another dream, and it actually took place before the first one, about that statue with the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet that were made of iron basically mixed with clay. It not only represented his kingdom, which was the head of gold, but also the next three that would succeed him. Understanding the feet of iron mixed with clay also represents the final stage of that final kingdom. But it also represented another kingdom, one that was going to put an end to all these kingdoms that would eventually grow until it filled the entire earth and would endure forever. Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 through 35, where Daniel explaining uh, this, or actually explaining to Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar said, you have to tell me what the dream is and then explain it. Well, Daniel says this, you continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. It became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This stone, or what's represented by this stone, was going to put an end to these other kingdoms and it was going to fill the earth. And he goes on to explain what that stone is, basically, in verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. In the days of those kings, the, the legs of iron represented Rome, the feet mixed with clay represented the weakness of Rome, the toes, the different Caesars. In the days of those kings, God was going to set up another kingdom. And that's exactly what he did in the days of Christ. Jesus came as a king, and even though the Jews rejected him, God didn't. That was his plan. And he made him king over this kingdom. It was set up, and it is continuing to grow, and it will until it fills the whole earth. Now finally, Jesus tells us what the citizens of this kingdom would be like in the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. He says in verses 44 through 46, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So who are the citizens of this kingdom? They would be those who would be willing to part with everything that they have as Jesus plainly tells us that that's what we must do to inherit the kingdom, that they would be willing to do this to be a part of that kingdom. So here, basically, Jesus gives us a, a picture of the kingdom of heaven. He, he shows us what its nature is like. It's not like the kingdoms of the earth. It's not, you know, a, a geopolitical kingdom. It's not military, as it were. Rather, it is a spiritual kingdom. That, that grows the spread of the gospel, and it's one that is going to eventually permeate the entire earth. It is going to be resisted, but those who love the Lord and are willing to pay the price are going to work to advance it. Now, understanding that that is its nature, let's consider what our particular role is in the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, we do need to understand that our role depends on whether or not, first of all, we happen to be citizens of that kingdom. In other words, whether we're the wheat that the Father has sown in the world or whether we're part of the tares that the enemy has sown. And how can we tell the difference? Well, the last two parables give us the key. We are citizens of Christ's kingdom if we have given up everything to be a part of it. Jesus said on one occasion to the crowds who were following him in Luke 14, verse 33, So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. You know that Jesus said the same thing to the rich young ruler. And I know that when we hear this, it does give us a little bit of concern because is Jesus telling us that we need to part with everything that we have in order to follow him? Sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. That would be a little bit difficult to do in this day and age because Jesus isn't walking where we can necessarily follow him in that way. So what exactly does Jesus mean here? Well, he certainly means this, that all of our idols need to go. And an idol is anything that we love and desire more than his kingdom because whatever that is is going to stop us from doing what it is he calls us to do. It cuts the nerve, cuts the heart out of your service. If you don't love him more, whatever that thing is that has, you know, it, well, is, is greater in your affections, you're going to go after it. And you're not going to be able to let it go and do what the Lord calls you to do. Now, this applies to everything, basically. It applies to those we care about the most. Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now again, understanding that the Lord calls us to love our neighbors, we love ourselves. He's not literally telling us here that we need to hate these people. But he is telling us that by comparison to our love for him, our affection needs to be looked at or at least to be so far removed as to be literally hatred and if any of these would stand in our way of serving the Lord we must love him more and serve him it certainly applies to our accomplishments in this world or what we might hope to accomplish remember Paul in Philippians 3 verses 7 through 8 as he's telling about all the things that he had accomplished in a worldly way as a Pharisee when he found Christ, or when Christ found him, he said this, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish or dung, so that I may gain Christ. Basically, Paul is saying not only the things that I have accomplished, but whatever I could possibly accomplish apart from Christ, these things are worthless to me. You see, if these things become idols too, and if that's what you're going for in the world, you're not going to be able to serve Christ the way he calls you to serve him because your heart will be going after those things. Those are the things you'll be pursuing. You have to love Jesus more. Whatever was gained to you, you have to count as loss for the sake of Christ. It applies to everything that is in this world, at least the world as it's conceived as being in the power of the evil one. John writes in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 16, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father but is from the world. And he goes on to tell us that those who are of the world will perish with the world. I read this passage over and over again to remind myself as well as to remind each one of us that those things that the world considers to be you know, uh, the most important thing, the thing that they live for, the thing that they're seeking for, the very things that God tells us if we love, that his love is not in us. We can't pursue those things of the world. We can't pursue our own glory. We can't pursue the glory and honor of the world and expect to arrive in heaven. We can't. We have to give those things up in order to follow Jesus. 
Jesus already told us, but I'll read it again. He said this applies even to our own lives. We can't even hold on to them. We have to be willing to let them go. That means, of course, everything we might do with them, as well as putting them on the line to serve him. In Matthew 16, verses 24 through 25, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And again, Jesus means by that both of the things that I mentioned. We have to give up our lives while we're living to serve him. If we hold on to them, we will lose our lives. We won't inherit the kingdom because it requires the giving up of everything we have to the Lord. We have to pick up our cross and follow him. But also it refers to whether or not we will hold on to our lives when serving Christ means we have to die for him. If we deny Christ to save our lives, he will deny us because his love is not in us. Now we do have to modify that a bit, certainly there have been people who in weakness have denied Jesus, like Peter, who later repented. But if this is the nature of our hearts, to continually deny him, then obviously we cannot claim to be citizens of this kingdom because this is not the character of the citizens of this kingdom. The, their character is the willingness to give up everything to have that kingdom. That's how precious it needs to be. So if you are a citizen of this kingdom, if this kingdom belongs to you, if you have basically genuinely turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ, you will look at everything that you have and everything you will ever have basically as worthless except how you might use what you have for the glory of the Lord. Remember, we are stewards, you know, stewards of the Lord. A stewardship has been entrusted to us, everything we have is a charge given to us that we are to use for Christ's glory. And that is how we will view the kingdom uh, as basically in, in light of what it is we possess. We will use what we have to glorify our Lord. Now that's what Jesus says is true of those who see the value of the kingdom and who possess the kingdom. They're willing to give up everything. And if that doesn't describe you, then basically it's what Jesus is saying here is, is not that you have to do these things before you can have it. It's not a works righteousness. But what he is telling you is you still need to repent and you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because you don't yet have that kind of heart. That heart only comes through Christ. If you look to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you repent and believe on him, he will give you that kind of heart. As a matter of fact, we know he already will have given it to you because that's what you need in order to make this kind of sacrifice in order also to trust him and to turn from your sins. If you don't, well, the parable of the wheat and the tares and the parable of the dragnet reminds us of the consequences of the one who will not receive the Lord Jesus Christ, who will not become wheat but remain tares, who won't be the good fish but be the worthless fish. They're going to be gathered and thrown into the furnace of fire. So that is the threat. The fear of the Lord is meant to cause us to run to Christ so that we might be saved. Now, if on the other hand, what the parables of the treasure in the field, uh, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price does describe you, if you already have this kind of heart, if you are already wheat, as it were, as described in the parable of the wheat and the tares, that is the sons of the kingdom, then what is it that the Lord calls you to do? in his kingdom. What is your role? What is your purpose? Well, here's where the parable of the sower comes in. You see, if the seed of the gospel has taken root in the good soil of your heart by God's grace, then you are to produce the fruit of good works. A hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirty, you are to be bearing good fruit for the Lord. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The first thing you are to do is bear good fruit, to be a light in this world, to point people to God, to point them to Christ so they might be reconciled to God. You are to be, in other words, a leavening influence in the world. You know, that leavening influence we see in the parable of the leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that works its way through the three measures of flour until it's all leavened. Well, what is that leaven? It's the children of the kingdom doing the work that God has called them to do to advance the kingdom in the world. You are to labor in everything you do to advance the kingdom of heaven, as we see in the parable of the mustard seed. It begins small, but it grows. But the way that it grows is by influencing people with the gospel so that when they embrace Christ, they become this influence in the world. And in this way, the kingdom continues to grow until it influences all the kingdoms of the world. And of course, the main way that you are to do this is not just by doing good works, but doing a particular good work, which is sharing the gospel with others, which is what we see in the parable of the sower. You know, the sower went out to sow. Well, who is the sower? The sower is everybody who possesses the gospel, who knows its value, and has been charged by Christ to take that gospel and share it with others. The Lord has sown you in this world as wheat so that you may affect other people with your life, by your testimony, by your witness, so that basically at the end of the age when the angels gather everyone out of the kingdom, there's going to be more that are kept and fewer that are thrown away. I personally believe that there's going to be fewer saved than, than um, lost. But through our efforts, we know that the Lord is going to bring his sheep in. We have to be actively involved. We don't want to, as we think about the plan of God, and we know that he has his and he's going to gather his and there are a specific number of people and so forth, but we can't look at it as though it's divorced from our efforts. We have to get active. We have to be doing this work so that more will be saved, as it were. No more are going to be saved than what the Lord has determined. That's true. But if we don't do anything, then nobody's going to be saved because of us. We need to be doing this work. Now, the Lord wants to use you to reach out to others so that they too may know of his love and grace in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So understanding the nature of Jesus' kingdom and the commission that he has entrusted to us, what we need to do is everything in our power to cast as much seed of the gospel as we possibly can, as far and as wide as we can, while we have the opportunity that as many as possible might be saved. So may the Lord help us in this work. May he help us to tear down all the idols. May he help us to get focused. May he help us to know the nature of the kingdom and know what our responsibilities are in the kingdom. May he encourage us through the promises that he's given to us that in the parable of the sower. There's a lot of seed broadcast. Not everybody is saved, but there are those who are. And those are the ones that we are basically laboring for. Those are Christ's sheep, the ones he's going to bring into his kingdom. So may the Lord encourage us through these promises as well. And as we saw also in the feeding of the 5,000, the promise of reward that the Lord is going to give to us, that reward, the kingdom of heaven and the rewards that are there should be precious enough to, to move us forward to do what the Lord has called us to do. So may the Lord help us to see these things and may he help us to know our roles and most of all, may he help us by his grace to fulfill them, to actually do what it is he calls us to do here. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.